describes the becoming a Christian. The old life is really death, but the new life is real life in the presence of God's prayer. God made us alive, and some more place times when you read your Bible, it'll say quicken, but quicken and made alive means exactly the same. He made us alive in him because he has work for us to do. We're still studying Ephesians, and Paul wrote this book during his imprisonment in Rome. He was living in a rented house, and he could receive visitors, but being a prisoner, he could not move out as he pleased. And he faced the threat of judgment against him, and we know that threat is simply execution at any time the emperor would have wanted it to happen. Even as a prisoner, Paul repeatedly emphasized that Christians have an exalted place in God's plan, being raised from the dead to eternal life. Paul's message to the Ephesians emphasizes the perspective of God. From God's throne, Christians are not downtrodden, but victorious. Not rebels, but God's agent of renewal for the world. Christians are the grateful recipients of everything that God has done. And what are some of the things he has done? Well, we experience God's eternal blessings. We anticipate still a greater future when Christ returns. And we live together as the temple of God. But this status was all God. It was all his work in Christ to rescue them the Ephesians, and us from this helpless state of death and make them and us alive to all that God has done for them and for us. Thus, showing God's love to others isn't a competition. It's not a check-off list that I did better than you. That's a competition, and it's not that. Because God doesn't keep score do the best we can and that's all we can do and he and he understands that so he doesn't keep score so we'll pick up where we've been out where we've left off for the last two weeks and we will start in chapter two and we'll see two parts in this book or in our lesson today we'll see our previous self and we'll see ourself with god so the first the first uh, section is titled dead in sin and we are all dead in sin because of what happened in the garden of eden so, Linda, will you read one and two, please? And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past <coughs> ye walked according <coughs> to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So, with the opening and you, Paul moves from God's display of power in Christ to the results for humanity. God has also given us resurrection from the, from the dead. The immediate result of this transaction is life in the spiritual nature because it's in the spiritual nature is the consequence for our trespasses and our sins. We didn't die physically at the instant that it happened in the Garden of Eden. They didn't die instantly. They lived for a, a lot more years, but they died spiritually. The relationship that they had, walking and talking with God, remember, they hid. So that's the spiritual nature that they're talking about here. And so when that sin happened, that spiritual nature is what was broken. Paul's uh, point in all this is, all were guilty of the rebellion against God, all deserve death, which is the consequence for sin. Sin. And as we read in Romans, a lot of this lesson today goes back and picks up a couple of chapters in Romans, uh, especially, I think, maybe you could say, well, this is out of, out of two. You've got chapter six, you know, all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Uh, the wages of sin is death. So we, you can go back and kind of read that. So he is saying, we're all in the same boat. Nobody is excluded. We get excluded because we have accepted what Christ has done for us, and we are covered by his blood. As we pray, our family members, our lost members, they haven't had that yet. And that's what we pray that will ha eventually happen. So to be a sinner is to be spiritually dead, without true life, without connection to God, without hope. And to die in one sin is to be eternally separated from God forever, 
with no hope of life following once one has died. Before coming to Christ, facing Christ, Paul's readers lived under the sway of the trend and influences of the world in rebelling against God. Paul's readers do, you can say, we do today. What we're saying all these thousands of years ago, I think we could say it as prevalent today. Even it said the children of disobedience, the spirit of that in the power, we were praying, you know, drive this evil. Well, that's that power we're talking about in the air. It says before they came to love and submit to Christ, they were actually in bondage. Before we came, we were in bondage. The bondage of sin, which gave us death. From this, Paul now gives us three points that he wants to talk about. First, they lived according to the course of the world. And that simply means they acted as, as God's standards for living were not valid. It's like snubbing our nose at God. We don't want what you've got for us. We know better. And when we just think that attitude, we're in hot water. And water are some of the things that we just kind of do that with, the acts that we have. Well, selfish sin. How about moral failure? How about dishonesty? Because it's hard to find truth out there anymore. Everybody wants to call right wrong and wrong right. All right. He said, because of that, we are, near, we, we are near, neither free nor are we godly. His second point, he <coughs> says that we serve the, the prince of the power of the air. And as you read and study, that is, no, that is simply the devil and his dominion. So the spiritual beings who are in rebellion against God are not our friends, but they seek to destroy and keep us out of fellowship with God. All the air refers to the spiritual nature of this evil. Because he says principalities, all the air, we see that throughout, and that's his domain. Even so, Jesus has authority and victory against all the spiritual forces that have rebelled against God. When he died and went to the grave, he got, the, he got all authority back that was lost in the Garden of Eden. He now holds the keys to life, to all life. This is an ongoing battle. So this takes us to Paul's third point that he wants to point out, and we find that in verse 3. Debbie, will you read verse 3? Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, so his third element promotes sin lies within us. We all have been driven in times past by personal lusts of the flesh. Sometimes you'll see it, pride of the eyes or lust of the eyes. This time he's talking about the flesh. What the flesh wants, the flesh gets. And then you feel guilty for giving it to it. So that's what he's talking about. So such behavior includes desires of the flesh and all the mind. Sometimes we think things and that just gets us there too. If one's body indicates that something feels good, the person may do it despite moral consequences. There's that nice, good piece of cake. I just need to eat that cake. And then after I eat it, what do I do? I feel guilty. Because I didn't eat it because I just put weight on. So that's kind of like, you know, what the mind wants, what the eyes want. When we give in, we do it. And then we think, I shouldn't have done that. And then, of course, there are consequences. So once I eat the cake, guess what? I might gain a pound. <laughs> and then it'll take forever to get it off. Um, he goes on to say, so the problem is inside of us. We all have that problem. It's, it's in how we think and what we want. And we live in a society that wants everything now. We don't want to wait to find out if we really want it or need it. We buy uh, just on the spur of the moment, and then we regret that decision. So, it, so where does all this start? It starts inside of us. So we have a daily battle to control the lust of the flesh and all the mind. And also another, I think it's in James, I think it's in the pride of the pride, the lust of the eyes, and that's considered pride. So we have those three things we have to combat every day. Goes on to say that the children of wrath or, uh, or the unbelievers and then he includes this, so we're not, so everybody is included, and others. So there is no exclusion. That is all. Believers, 
or, or, or the children of wrath, they're the same thing, the lost and others. So that's all inclusive in God's kingdom. All deserve wrath. All deserve death. And without Christ, all the children are of wrath. And I wrote lost when I was reading this. If we're not with God, then we are lost, and then we are considered children of wrath. So as a result of our inherent inherent tendency to sin, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now this is in Romans 3 here. That's why I said you could probably go back and read 2 through 6. But you will find that phrase um, a numerous times in the Old Testament. I can't tell you off the top of my head exactly where they are, but they are also in the Old Testament. So in our former life, we are slaves to passion and to lust. And what are some of these? Well, we're infatuated by the sinful world. In other words, we're enticed, infatuated. I guess, you know, that when you first fell in love, you were infatuated, you know, every minute you thought about the person. We are beset by temptations from the evil one constantly. We are controlled by our out of pa control passion for forbidden fruits that is desired by both the body and the mind. As I said, you want it, you take it. And then you regret you ever did it. That's the instant. Now, that is before we know Christ. That is before our sins are covered by Christ's blood. We are dead. Even though we are physically alive right this instant in this body, we are dead because when we do die physically, if we don't have Christ's blood over us, we will be separated forever from God's presence. So now, and I want you to look at the first two words in verse 4. So everything that happened in verse 3, Paul is saying, but God. All of that will happen to us in verse 3, or has happened to us in verse 1 through 3. But God. But God, I didn't go that way. You know, we talk about it. Uh, someone went down a path, maybe a really horrible path, I don't know, drugs or whatever. I didn't go that way, but God. You didn't go that way, but God. Who was controlling your life back then? Even though you weren't his, but God. So this is where Paul's gone. So we now transition from this death that will separate us from God forever to life with God, and Paul starts out, but God. So let's look at verse 4, Brenda. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. So how do you get rid of verses 1 through 3, or how do you overcome 1 through 3? But God. But God. And therefore you go from being lost, uh, being a wrath of, uh, of, the children, of the children of wrath, or being an unbeliever, you give your life to God. So let's see what he says here. Heaven characterized one's pre-Christian's past, as, con cons as consisting in infatuation with the worldly influences, devil-driven disobedience, and indulgences in, indulgences in the sinful passion, Paul moves the discussion to the reader's future life. A shift from and you to but God. If God had no wrath, the world would have no justice. But if God had no mercy, the world would have no hope. But thanks be to God, we are not left to ourselves. Just as he is rich in mercy, he not only gave us mercy, but he is even rich in mercy. Richer in his grace. Because of God's infinite wisdom, utter righteousness, and richness of grace, his eternal plan is to be merciful through this self-sacrificial work of Christ. God's justice is satisfied by Christ's righteousness or righteous life and his self-sacrificial death. The innocent Lord himself willingly took our place, paid the price for the guilty on the cross. <laughs> by this amazing means, God can be both righteous and gracious, both just and merciful. And if you really want to look that up, I did look that up, and I added the, these verses, Romans 3, 21 through 28. Not just a two in the middle, but if you go back, it picks up in 21, and it goes through 28 is what I, when I read that. Any hope for us begins with God's mercy and God's love. Even while deserving God's wrath, people still bear his image. Remember, 
He breathed into us. We are made in his image uh, and his likeness. God has gone to great effort to save these lost image bearers, us lost image bearers, we are made in his image. We see a great example in God's attributes of being rich in mercy, describing God's mercy as a great love where, wherewith he loved us. And how great did he love us? You, everybody knows John three sixteen, that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. So what would be most precious to God? I'm not a parent, but are your kids most precious to you? Well, God gave us his son. That's great love. And then his son willingly went. He paid the price. He took the curse. He shed his blood. And we are like pardoned as we never sin once we come to him. Jesus did it all. So, God's mercy is great love wherewith he loved us, spending his, sending his exhaustible supply of mercy on us freely and lovingly. We can praise him. That's what we're talking about, praising God in, the, in Ephesians. We can praise him because his mercy endures forever. I don't know which one of those two Psalms, 18 or 36, 118, 136, but one of them, when you read, it's like two, it's like two verses. The top half is, is a set of words. The bottom half, his mercy endures forever. And I, I didn't look that up, but out of all those verses, you find that phrase as the refrain in that entire psalm. But well, you can find that in also other places, but his mercy does not endure forever. God doesn't change. We are the ones that have changed and need to change. Five and uh, six, Donna. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, we are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, life before Christ was one of being dead in sins. That's what Paul has talked about in the first three verses. But as Christ has been raised from the dead, death uh, to resurrected life, so too are we quickened, and as I said, that means made alive. Through faith we are joined with Christ, and if we're joined with Christ, then we are joined with his resurrection. Transferred from death to life, a resurrection that is both present and future, and salvation that is also present and future. By grace are you saved, serves as two, two points or two purposes. One. It anticipates a fuller explanation of salvation by grace that Paul will write about a little bit later. And two, it helps paint a, bit, a larger picture of God's attitude toward his wayward children as his grace is considered alongside his mercy and his grace. I mean, his love. And we, we talk about love, mercy, and grace. That's the three things. If we had those, then evil would flee. God's love has no bounds, God's mercy has no bounds, and God's um, grace has no bounds. It's freely there. We just have to freely receive, as that song said. Our spiritual resurrection from the dead, from death of sin is also followed by ascension. Remember after uh, the 40 days after Christ arose from the dead, you know, people saw him, uh, different, you know, witnesses. And what did he do? They watched him go up to heaven. He ascended. Well, one day we will do the very same thing. So Christ's story is now our story. Christ's life is now our life. Christ ascended to heaven after his resurrection. And following our resurrection from spiritual death, we are to be positioned in heavenly places with Christ. What did he tell his disciples? I go to a place, I will prepare you a what? In my Father's house are many mansions. So, and he says, where I am, you will be also. So he has prepared a place for us. And when our time on earth is done, you've got a mansion waiting on you. Now, that's something to be rejoicing over. So by God's grace, we share Christ's victory and are agents of Christ's rule. And again, it's all whom? Us or God? 
It's all God. God does all of this. Uh, verse 7, uh, Mary. And in the ages to come, he might show exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. So Paul gives the eternal reason for God's rescue of sinners from death to from this spiritual death, and that is that we might serve as a demonstration of his marvelous grace forever. The era begins with salvation through faith in Christ. It is not immediate, but it will be for the ages to come. Paul pictures God's grace as inexhaustible riches, and to this he also adds God's kindness. Some places it says loving kindness. So not only do we have God's riches, we also have God's kindness. So think about it. Kind of sounds like a fruit of the Spirit. Love, gentleness, kindness. I can't name them all, but that's what God is. So God's kindness is an offer that shows us uh, to, to draw us to him. All of this comes from God and his nature. Nothing from us except to believe and to confess our sins. What do we have to do in this deal? That's it. I am a sinner, O oh Lord. Please come into my life. He did all the work. I just did. That's the only two things I need to do. Confess and, and repent. And when I do, and when we do, guess what? We will be in unity with God. Be one with God. And we will be in his presence forever. Uh, eight and nine. Um, Renee. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I would say verse 9, or maybe 8b, or 8 and 9 together would be your key verses. I didn't look at the, I didn't look at the lesson to even thank God about the that she was reading. Those would be, and, and especially part 9. It is not by works, because if it was, we could all boast, well, I did this, and this is why I got that. It's all by a gift. All you got to do is open the, open the box and receive it. So by grace are ye saved. Salvation by grace expects or requires a response. The salvation God offers is no effect unless accepted through faith on the part of the one who is dead in sin. And they define faith as this, assent plus trust. I never heard of that until I read in this lesson today. But they say assent is accepting the gospel as true. It's God's word. It's his holy word. And we should not add to it or detract from it. And then it is also trust. And trust is simply surrendering our control of our life to Jesus on the basis of who he is and what he has done. <laughs> it goes on to say, not of yourself. Paul really hits home. It's, it's nothing that we can do. Salvation is a gift. It cannot be earned. Someone gives you a gift, a box wrapped up. If you don't open it, have you truly received it? No. But if you open it, you have what? Received it, okay? So that's what he is saying here. It, it's a gift. Someone has given it to you. In this case, God. We are not partners with God. God doesn't need us, in other words. <coughs> but we are the recipients of what God has for us. So that again, you go back to the box of the gift. If you take the box, you have received it, you are the recipient of that package, that gift. <coughs> and who gave you the gift? For God so loved the world. He gave the gift. And so, huh? I've heard pastors say that, but I heard one say one time about opening the gift. Mm -hmm. But you don't reach in that box and just take out what you want. You take it all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, you would. That's true. But anyway, I went ahead and wrote this down. This came as I was reading and studying this lesson. I wrote, Jesus did the work. So we're talking about less, going down to verse 9 here. So it's all, as Paul started in verse 4, it is but God. Okay? So. This is what I wrote. It came to mind. Jesus did the work. He lived and died to pay our sin debt. Our part is to believe. Our salvation is from God, not of ourselves. And then to finish out that verse 9, it is not of works, 
Now, once we're saved, we should do good works. But the works are not going to get us there. Remember in Revelation, there's two books. One has our name written in the last book of life, and one has our name written in our works. Because it says we will be judged by our works. But works is not going to get us to heaven. And you can't work your way there. So I wrote this. We all come to God the very same way at the foot of the cross. It is a gift. We cannot earn it. We cannot buy it. And no matter what social status ladder you're on, <coughs> if you're the elite of the elite and the worst of the worst or the poor of the poor, I've got news for you. The poor is going to get there the same way you got there. Remember what Jesus said about the woman with the two mites? And the other, he said she gave from all her living, basically. And they only gave from their surplus, so they weren't hurting. She gave her entire li livelihood for the week. So it is by God, by it is a gift of God. It is not by works. It is by faith. Okay. And we all get there the same way. And our last verse, Pam, if you don't mind, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has foreordained that we should walk in them. Workmanship, image bearer, I believe those could be the same thing. For his workmanship, he created us, and he created us what? In his image. Our spiritual relation of re resurrection is God's workmanship. The very people whom God has made his delivered artful product. You know, God is a great uh, sculptor, creator, painter, whatever. He made you. He made us. I can't take anything and make anything. I tried to dress one time. I sewed a piece to the piece. <laughs> so instead of being this white, it was this white. I can't make anything. <laughs> okay. Anyway, y'all get the idea. So our new life has a purpose. That We got a purpose, God. We have been rescued from our spiritual desertion so that we might be instruments of his good works. And again, that is of God's good works. However, and so we're going to state it one more time, good works are not a payment for our salvation, nor are they the condition of receiving the gift. You do good works after you got the gift. Okay? The gift is free. In Christ, we have no motivation to, uh, we have a new motivation to serve and obey, and through the whole, God's Holy Spirit, we have a new power to do so. As our sin made the old creation spin into destruction, so by God's grace, our new creation sets us on a new course to do God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. So, you want, you want four through ten, but God. We are here because of God. Nothing that we can do. So this is my conclusion. So what has Paul been trying to tell us? Paul tells us two things. One, Paul reminds us to put our focus not on our inadequacies, but on Christ's ab abundance. In Christ, God has done everything for us. Forgiveness is full. His power is sufficient. Secondly, Paul reminds us that our best was never good enough. You know, if someone says, oh, you're a good person, well, you might be, but guess what? goodness is not going to get us to heaven. That he stands with Christ by his actions, not ours. And that whatever is good in our lives is now the result of freely receiving God's gift. So what does God offer? God has done all for us. But as we receive his gift, we will be forever different, set on a path to become what God the good God of grace and mercy has intended for us since the beginning. How will we, we how will we react to God's call? We can eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. There was a parable. Got the, he said it's about building, you know, his riches building barns. It's in Luke. I thought of that. We eat, drink, be merry today because we think no consequence is going to happen. And Jesus told, told the guy, he says, it's not your life is required of you. So take that, for, that, that part of it. All right, so then for tomorrow you will die. But then accepting God's gift is eternal life. And through, Christ's, and through that we have we're through Christ's victory. So here's your choice. The path we choose does make all the difference. 
do we want to remain children of wrath, unbelievers, lost? Or do we want to listen to God's call? The Holy Spirit calls us. Do we want to listen to that call and accept what God and what Christ has done for us? As someone says, He'll take you where you are. He'll do the cleaning. All you gotta do is give him your life. Dream, I know you haven't been with us for a while, but I enjoy listening to you pray. So can you close in prayer, please? Yes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our class and our lesson this morning and our teaching. We praise you, Lord, for your words of wisdom that you give us to take with us and get us through our weeks and days ahead. Father, your mercy is everlasting and your truth endures to the ages. May we receive your precious gift of Christ. And may we, as your handiwork, and in your image, may we live lives that fit the richness of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.